Welcome to E3 Rehab. I'm Dr. Mark Sertica, physical therapist. In today's video, I'm gonna answer questions that were submitted via my Instagram regarding the topic of total hip arthroplasty or total hip replacement surgery. If you're new to the channel, I had my hip replaced over 11 years ago at the age of 19. So I'm trying to create these resources to hopefully help out all of you from the perspective of a physical therapist and someone who had the surgery. As a quick disclaimer, I am a physical therapist, not a surgeon, and the information that I provide might not be completely applicable to you, so just make sure that you consult with your surgeon or physical therapist before changing anything about your exercise routine. The first question I wanna start with is how do you know if you need surgery? Well, from the perspective of surgeons, based on the research, they're generally looking at three things, pain, function, and radiological changes. Osteoarthritis of the hip is the primary indication for total hip replacements in over 90% of cases. The tricky thing is that pain associated with osteoarthritis can wax and wane, so you might have better days and worse days over the course of weeks, months, or even years. The other important thing to know is that radiological changes don't always correlate with your symptoms or function meaning that you can have significant changes on the x-ray and really have no change in pain or function, or you can have very minimal changes on the x-ray but have significant changes in pain and function. Ideally, because of these considerations, you'll have tried non-operative management for probably around six months, and that might include exercises, weight loss, and other interventions, but you know, if over time you're having significantly more pain, loss of function, decreased quality of life, and these associated radiological changes, then you might have that conversation with your surgeon and decide, you know, that that total hip replacement is right for you at that time. I probably went through about a year and a half process where I was having worse pain, worse function, poor quality of life, and my radiological changes because I had avascular necrosis we're actually getting worse over time, that kind of collapse of my femoral head. And so I waited as long as I possibly could, but it got to the point where I felt like I couldn't wait any longer and I finally went ahead with the surgery. And obviously it's not an easy decision to make, but I was really glad with my decision after the fact. And you know, for you, your decision is going to differ from mine and it's gonna differ from other individuals with a total hip replacement. You know, it's still gonna be based off of your, your pain, your function, these radiological changes, your quality of life, but you know, there's gonna be some uniqueness in determining when the surgery is most appropriate for you. So the next two questions kind of go hand in hand. Do I feel like patients should limit their range of motion after a total hip replacement surgery? And how great is the risk of dislocation? For context, post-operative range of motion precautions are given to minimize the risk of dislocation after the surgery. However, these recommendations vary quite a bit. Some surgeons give precautions to all patients and some give precautions to no patients. Some give precautions for longer durations and others shorter. It's also much more common in the posterior approach than it is for the lateral approach or anterior approach. So in the case of a posterior approach, your surgeon might tell you, not to flex your hip past 90 degrees, internally rotate your leg, or actually kind of pivot toward that leg in standing, and not cross your leg across midline. So that might mean that you can't bend down to tie your shoe, you might have to use a raised toilet seat, you know, if you lie or sleep on your side to have a pillow between your knees or two pillows uh, so that leg isn't crossing midline, and then just being mindful of how you're pivoting and turning while you're walking. There is research suggesting that these precautions don't actually reduce the risk of dislocation and patients resume activities quicker and report higher satisfaction when they aren't given these precautions. So in most cases, do I feel that patients need to limit the range of motion? Not necessarily, but I'm not a surgeon and so I probably don't carry the same risk if there was some sort of litigation that came about because of a dislocation so I definitely understand the concern and possibly the reason for prescribing them. And there might be some outliers where these precautions are beneficial because of various risk factors, 
such as older age or various comorbidities. And for the second question, how great is the risk of dislocation? It's actually very small. Data from the 2019 American Joint Replacement Registry shows that most revisions happen within three months of the surgery. If you're over the age of 90, about 2% of those individuals will require a revision in that time frame. And if you're under the age of 69, only about 1.2% of individuals will require a revision within that time frame. And this is for all possible reasons of early revision and dislocation wasn't at the top of that list. I imagine that if you're younger and healthier overall, that those numbers are probably even lower. Other data show that even if we look at instability or dislocation over the course of years, the risk is still usually far less than 2%. So overall, the risk of dislocation is low and its occurrence is multifactorial, but you should still speak with your surgeon about any concerns that you might have. So how long do total hip replacements actually last? The best data that we have is probably from a systematic review and meta-analysis in The Lancet by Evans et al. in 2019 that shows that the percentage of total hip replacements that lasted 15 years was 89%, 20 years was 70%, and 25 years was 58%. Improvements in techniques and implants will likely see these numbers rise in the coming years. So somebody asked me if I worry about multiple revisions. And honestly, the answer is no. Like I said, I had the surgery when I was 19. I'm 31 now, so I've had it for over 11 years. You know, if I'm expected to live another 40 or 50 years, it's without a doubt that I'll need another one or two revisions in my lifetime. And I'll also need a total hip replacement on the other side for a similar reason. So, you know, I've kind of accepted the hand that I was dealt and I don't really stress about it. I, I know that those revisions are coming and there's not really much I can do about it other than, you know, be smart with what I do, um, you know, in my day-to-day -day life. So for the next two questions, which exercises should be avoided to maximize the life of the joint? And then what other factors are at play there in terms of, you know, maintaining the longevity of the implant? I'm gonna go ahead and say that no exercise needs to be inherently avoided at the gym. A lot of individuals are worried about hurting themselves at the gym, but there are a lot more benefits associated with exercise than there are risks. And I would say being active probably comes with more risks in and of itself. Over the years, I've modified what I do in the gym because certain exercises just don't feel great for my hip. So I try to find what's comfortable for me and honestly, I don't think the approach needs to be much more complicated than that. You know, if you're feeling great, progressing well, checking in with your surgeon when you need to, I think that's fine for the most part. You know, if you are unsure about your gym routine or certain exercises, then consult with a good physical therapist near you. In terms of things that affect the life of the joint, it's really about being as healthy as you can. You know, don't smoke, eat healthy for the most part, and you know, exercise regularly. Uh, we'll talk about the extent of exercise, but for the most part, you know, you do things in moderation and that's the best that you can do. So a lot of people ask me about what activities you can do with the total hip replacement, and it's a pretty extensive list. Similar to the hip precautions, surgeons give different recommendations. Sometimes some say that high impact activities aren't necessarily allowed. A recent survey study in 2017 reported that 75% of surgeons recommend against contact sports, 59% against jogging on the road, and 56% against martial arts. However, many allowed jogging on the treadmill and lifting weights. So to get to specific questions, can you do yoga? In most cases, I don't see why not. I've done yoga dozens of times since I've had my total hip replacement. I've never had any issues. You know, I can't get into extreme positions and I don't try to force myself into extreme positions because I know my limitations and I make sure that I keep things comfortable. Um, and it's also about knowing that you're not gonna be as flexible on that side as if you didn't have a total hip replacement. So if you respect those limitations and set realistic expectations, I don't really see why you wouldn't be able to do yoga in at least some capacity. Can you golf, hike, and work out? Absolutely no problems there. Do I squat heavy? Well, heavy is relative. 
you know, I don't necessarily squat anymore. I prefer split squats or rear foot elevated split squats, but I regularly do sets of 12 with 140 pounds, which I think is pretty heavy for me, a 165 pound male. So yeah, I think you can still, you know, push yourself hard in the gym as long as things are comfortable for you. Can you run like normal after the surgery? In terms of actual technique, yes. In terms of longevity of the joint, different surgeons will give different recommendations as we saw earlier. There is some research that suggests that high levels of activity uh, or high impact sports can potentially reduce the longevity of the implant. But there also is a study from 2014 uh, that found that individuals who ran uh, didn't show any loosening or worsening of their components uh, after five years. You know, once again, it's likely about finding moderation, making sure that things are comfortable for you. And if you're unsure, having a conversation with your physical therapist or a surgeon and, you know, potentially weighing the risks and benefits if it's applicable to you. What's the criteria for going back to running if you have your heart set on it? Well, it's gonna be a bit individualized, but I would make sure that you're probably working with someone, right, who's taking you through a good strengthening program for your lower extremities and trunk, probably including some form of like jumping and landing progressions, and then, you know, gradually increasing your mileage over time, whether that's starting with walking or a really slow jog, you know, really building up to it. And then once again, you know, making sure that things are comfortable, you're progressing well. So everything is, you know, heading in the right direction. Um, you know, try to be as methodical as you can with your approach. Should you pace yourself if you're young and active? And if so, how should you accomplish that? As a healthcare provider, my responsibility is to tell you, yes, absolutely, you should pace yourself. However, I probably also understand your perspective as someone who had a total hip replacement at the age of 19 and the fact that for the three or four years leading up to it, I wasn't able to partake in the things that I wanted to do. So having the total hip replacement actually gave me a sense of normalcy and allowed me to do a lot of the things that I hadn't been able to do. I did a lot of activities in my 20s, like basketball, like football, softball, ultimate frisbee, mountain biking, skydiving, hiking 20 miles. And you know, I don't regret any of it and I'm really thankful that I was able to do those things. I never threw caution to the wind completely, but I also didn't hold myself back. You have to understand the possible risks associated with some of these activities and then decide if those immediate benefits, you know, outweigh the immediate risks and potential risks down the line. And for me at the time, right, skydiving, or going snowboarding and things like that were definitely worth the risk to me. If all you want to do is go back to playing competitive basketball for one more year because you really love it, but that means potentially reducing the life of the implant down the line, you know, you have to decide is that risk or the potential risk worth it for you. Overall, I already said it a couple times, you know, be active, and do things in moderation, but I'm not gonna be the one to scold you if you wanna continue doing something that you truly enjoy and you truly love uh, a little bit longer. All right, the last couple of questions revolve around post-operative uh, rehabilitation. So someone asked, you know, what do I do for a hip flexor issue? I would say number one, you have to make sure that it's actually a hip flexor issue, meaning that like if you're going down into a squat and you're feeling a pinch in the front of your hip, probably isn't a hip flexor issue. But you know, if you're doing repetitive hip flexion, um, you know, and it's associated with that active motion, then there's a lot of things that you can do. And it kind of depends on your goals, on the activities. But I would try to keep it simple, reducing or modifying things like load, you know, frequency, tempo, these different parameters around your programming um, that can allow you to train at a comfortable level by you know uh, pulling some of those levers or manipulating some of those parameters and then eventually introducing more over time so that you can do more. And in the case of a total hip replacement, right? If you had some issues uh, leading up to it and it took a while for you to get the surgery, 
probably have some atrophy, some changes in range of motion, some changes in strength, and you know, building those things back up are gonna take time. The next question is how do you teach the elderly to walk again? And I don't think that it has to be too complicated. You know, if they're using an assistive device, they're gonna be using it as long as they need to for uh, their pain and function. And over time, you know, they're gonna use that less and less. You're gonna build up their walking more and more. And then you're gonna incorporate different things to you know, improve the strength of their lower extremities and trunk, challenge their balance. Um, but I don't necessarily think that you need to do like a lot of these motor control exercises where you're really trying to you know, teach them how to walk again. You know, I think if they regain their range of motion, their endurance, their strength, their balance, you know, their natural gait is probably gonna return on its own. And then the last one is asking about like PT education on how to put on and take off shoes. You know, if there's no precautions, then it should be pretty simple. If there are precautions, you know, I would make it as easy as possible trying to find shoes that they can slip on easily um, that don't also, you know, increase their fall risks. So just making sure that the shoes are, are comfortable, easy to put on, um, you know, and allows them to kind of walk normally. So if you made it to the end, thank you so much for watching. This is the first Q&A that I've done, so I don't know how well I did, but you know, hopefully you found something valuable from this information. Uh, and if you did, I would appreciate, you know, if you hit the like button, subscribe, and comment below. You know, what else do you want to see? Um, as I've said in previous videos, we have three videos on our channel of me talking about my experience as a 19 year old with a hip replacement, um, kind of walking through some basic exercise progressions that you can do, you know, after the first few months of, of surgery to build up strength and range of motion there. Um, and then a video of me and kind of how I generally train my lower extremities. Um, and then on our website, it's a really long blog that has all of the research that I kind of discussed today and it goes into much more depth and then now this Q&A. So if there's other things that you want to see that you think will be helpful and that you know I have the capacity to make, I'd love to make those resources for you. So just let me know. Peace.